Unfortunately, we've had to edit out some important information because big tech won't let us say that sort of thing. To listen to the full uncut show, go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. I think one of the reasons I get uptight when people point to my sinfulness is because I'm afraid. Like I'm afraid I'm ultimately unlovable, that I am wretched at the end of the day and um, uh, unsalvageable as it were. But the Psalms speak continually as God is our refuge. And so one thing I like to say as a Christian, because I think it's true, is that Christ is the only refuge big enough for your poor and wretched heart. And you don't need to apply your own meanness and narrow little heart to His. God is infinite in mercy. And when your sin goes up against that, this is like a drop of water being flicked into a raging furnace. Matt Frad is a Catholic apologist and the host of the popular podcast, Pints with Aquinas. Originally from Australia, Frad is an eloquent defender of Catholic teachings and a champion of civil discourse around even the most contentious topics, ranging from pornography to religious philosophy. On his podcast, Frad often utilizes Thomas Aquinas' objection and response style of discussion to break down complex religious subjects. Frad's guests have included The Daily Wire's very own Michael Knowles, Matt Walsh, and most recently, Jordan B. Peterson. As an author, Frad combines his intellectual depth with a pastoral purpose. In his 2018 book, The Porn Myth, he aims to discredit pornography through a non-religious lens. Whereas in his 2021 work, How to Be Happy, St. Thomas' Secret to a Good Life, Frad seeks to cultivate a greater appreciation for the Catholic faith in our modern world. In today's episode, we dissect ideas like toxic skepticism, the West's normalization of sin, and the pragmatic application of Catholic principles. We also explore what it means to be free and compare the ritual similarities between Catholicism and Judaism. Stay tuned for this fantastic conversation with Matt Frad and discover what makes Pints with Aquinas a must-listen for anyone interested in faith, philosophy, and the intersection of religion and modern culture. Welcome back to another episode of The Sunday Special. Matt, thanks so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So let's, let's talk about how you engage in discussion. Sure. With, with people who oppose you. Yeah. Because uh, that, that's something that you, you frequently do. You, you don't like to term it debate because debate is very often about winners and losers as opposed to discussion, which is really more about clarifying positions and determining where people stand. So when you're discussing, say, atheism with someone, mm-hmm. now, w- what do you find is, is the best way to approach that particular issue when you're beginning a discussion with an atheist about believing in the Bible, believing in Jesus, mm-hmm. you're obviously a Catholic. Uh, what, what's the best way to approach that discussion? Defining terms. What is meant by atheism? I think there's been something of a shift since the new atheists that would seek to redefine atheism to mean something indistinguishable from agnosticism. It seems to me, though, that there are three basic ways you can answer the question, does God exist? Yes, no, or maybe. And so it seems appropriate to me that there should be three terms that would identify the possessors of each belief. Atheist, uh, uh, theist, or or agnostic. Uh, I don't know. Only the theist and the atheist has a burden of proof because they're the only ones claiming something. So I think that would be the first way to go about it. Are there good reasons to think that atheism is true? Are there good reasons to think that theism is true? And I, I, don't, I don't like debates, not because I don't believe in them, but because I'm not good at them. I find I get quite flustered and I don't think quite straight. I don't think I'm a very kind of confrontational person. But I do enjoy talking to people who disagree with me in a friendly way, like over a beer or something like that which is what Pints with Aquinas is about, really just sitting down and, and giving each other the benefit of the doubt, not trying to corner each other and just trying to understand where each other is coming from. So you, you mentioned there the kind of shift in the new atheist community from atheism to agnosticism. And that, that is clearly what has happened. I mean, there, there used to be an argument militantly anti-God, and God for certain does not exist. You're a fool if you believe mm-hmm. in religion or in, or in uh, a, a, a deity. And, and that has moved into pretty solidly, well, I, I don't know and I don't care. So... How would you engage that particular argument? Because that, that seems to be the more common one in today's day and age. Uh, and even people who tend to think that they're theists will say things like, I'm spiritual but not religious, which, yeah. is, which is effectively indifferent about, about the presence of God in their lives. How, how do you engage in the agnostic argument? Yeah, it's a good question. First of all, I just want to say, obviously, there are atheists who have arguments against God's existence, and there are very intelligent atheists. But you're right, a lot of people just don't care. It seems to me that if God does not exist, we have dogmatic answers to the most important questions we're all most interested in asking. Like, where did I come from? Why am I here? Who am I? How should I live? And where am I going? It struck me that if God doesn't exist, then here are the answers. Where did I come from? I've been coughed into existence by a blind cosmic process that didn't have me in mind. Uh, You and I are accidental byproducts of nature. There is no uh, objective mind-independent meaning for our life. We can adopt subjective meanings 
uh, so we feel better about ourselves or something. But these aren't actually the reasons why we exist. How should we live? Well, we could live in a way that's conducive to the flourishing of our group, or we could not. And it doesn't seem to me that uh, we'd be right or wrong to adopt one of these positions if there is no moral objective moral law. Where are we going? We will die. And uh, not just individually, but collectively as a species, cosmologists tell us that as the universe continues to expand, there'll eventually be nothing you know, spreading out through seemingly infinite space, just cosmic soup. None of that is an argument for God existing, of course. It might be that bleak and we might just have to deal with it. But I'm going to need a good reason to think things are that bleak. And I think when I was a, a, a high schooler, I didn't really vibe with Christianity. I didn't like what it taught. I didn't like the, the mm, I didn't believe in the witness of the people who went to church. And so I stopped going. I said I was agnostic. But I think questions like that, like, does it bother you that, that, that this is all meaningless? What if it wasn't? Would you want to know? Maybe those are the sorts of questions that could provoke desire to then have a more meaningful discussion about God. I mean, when, when you talk about that, I think realistically, actually, the agnostic view is even bleaker than that because you're using active verbs to describe how people can react to the meaninglessness of existence. If you're a pure scientific materialist, the idea that you are self-motivated, that you can self-will, the sort of the, the ability for existentialists to claim agency mm. that seemingly arises from nowhere, just from the processing of, of neurons, uh, is, uh, is something that, that I think is, is very difficult to overcome. And so it's not even that you can make a sort of Jean-Paul Sartre argument that you can escape the, the bleakness of existence by acts of will or the Nietzschean argument. That, that shouldn't really even exist in a cold materialist universe because, again, you're just a piece of meat wandering through space on a rock, effectively speaking. And so you know, that, that sort of argument is, um, you know, the, again, it's very difficult, I think, number one, to build an individual life on that basis, and also to build a society on that basis. And furthermore, when, when I hear people make that argument, because they say, uh, I'll say, so why, why is that argument important for you to make? And I'll say, well, because it's true. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you're, you're into Alvin Platinga land. Like, okay, well, what do you mean by true? Mm -hmm. What truth exists independent of simple evolutionary biology? You say that it's very important that you know this thing because this thing is true, but does truth have an independent meaning without an independent creator of that truth who stands above that truth? It's interesting that you mention Alvin Plantinga because he is famous for developing this idea of properly basic beliefs. In other words, we all have beliefs and some of those beliefs are basic, meaning they're not based upon other beliefs. If we had to have an argument for every belief that we hold, that would lead to an infinite regress and we wouldn't believe in anything. Uh, but Plantinga said that some beliefs are properly basic. That is to say, we are warranted uh, epist uh, epistemically to hold certain beliefs even without arguments. Um, he would say without evidence, but it depends what you mean by evidence, such as uh, the reality of other minds or that the universe wasn't created five minutes ago with the appearance of age and breakfast in my stomach I never ate and things like this. It seems like we're all rational to believe in these things, even though we might not be able to give arguments for them. And I think most people believe in God like that. They're embarrassed to say that that's why they believe in God. They would like to have some awesome metaphysical argument that has completely convinced them. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I believe in God because of, of arguments any more than I believe in free will because of arguments or that I exist because of argu arguments. It just sort of seems to make sense to me. And I know that that's not a reason why somebody else should believe in God, but it seems to be an okay reason for why I believe in God. And so therefore, if you want to disavow me of my belief in God, then, then I'd like I'd like a reason, sort of like, uh, what's his name? Neo in The Matrix was given a reason by Morpheus to now doubt the reality, what would he thought of as reality? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that is such a good point. It's a point that Michael Oshot makes, just just this idea that rationalism is essentially, if you take it to its logical extreme, it, it's it's like an Ouroboros, it, it eats itself. Uh, that, that most of the beliefs that we hold dear to ourselves are, are beliefs that we just know to be true. 100%. Uh, and, and so this bizarre idea yep. that, that most of the beliefs that we come to are things that we have rationalized our way to. Number one, is incredibly arrogant because it's not true. Um, but, but number two, it actually leads, as you say, to a sort of infinite regress because there is no root reason to assume that rationality itself exists as sort of an independent property mm. of, of human beings. The idea that there is an independent reason and that reason and logic govern well, that, again, that's an assumption, and you're going to have to justify that assumption based on something, but there can't be an assumption underneath that, that particular assumption. And, and this is one of the things that, as I've gotten older 
And as you move away from being a teenager where you think, okay, I want a reason for everything, which is totally natural when you're 17, 18 years old. You think, okay, you know, my parents didn't give me a good reason for this, so I'm just not going to do it. And then you get older and you realize, well, sometimes you're, most of the time you're doing things not because there was a good reason to do them, but because there's a good reason not to do the alternative. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's really important and, and speaks to the, the sort of reality of what it means to be a human being. So much of modern politics, modern religion, mo modern, modern thought is based on this bizarre idea that human beings are atomistic individuals who exist without any sort of presets. There are no presets in your, in your being. And so you approach every argument with an equivalent, with an equivalent weight on every argument, as opposed to, mm -hmm. well, actually you exist in this system mm -hmm. and you have to be given some pretty strong evidence as to why you ought to disbelieve this system before you move outside of that system. I think that was the original point that you're making. You know, you're gonna have to be some, give me some good reasons as to why I ought to jettison things like free will, rationality, eternal truths. Mm -hmm. like, what, what, what's the pitch? I think since Descartes, maybe we've had this idea that we have to have some unhuman, inhuman way of being certain about things, as if the only reason I can be justified in believing anything is if it's indubitable or self-evident or something like that. But um, you know, if you were to press me on how I know Australia is an island, I'd sound kind of silly. I'd be like, I've seen it in maps and stuff. <laughs> and you'd be like, you believe everything maps show you? And I'd go, yeah, I thought, you know, like, <laughs> or you know, if somebody says, do you believe you have hands? And you're like, yes. And then they say, but do you believe you have hands? At that point, some people would be like, oh, I'm not sure. And that's a trick. It's a trick in that emphasis. Of course, you know, you have hands. Of course, you could be dreaming. But everything we believe, we don't believe with this unusual degree of certainty. And so I don't think that theists should feel bad if uh, they, they, they sometimes have doubts or something like that. We'll get to more on this in a moment. First, when did we decide to stop upholding free speech as a basic right? What's playing out right now at big tech companies and social media sites sets a pretty dangerous precedent. Everybody should have the right to express themselves freely. Sadly, the big tech monopoly has instead opted for silencing tactics and censorship. To fight back against big tech's control of the internet, I use ExpressVPN. Free to access tech giants make all their money by tracking your searches, video history, and everything you click on. They build your profile, they sell that data off to the highest bidder. When you use the ExpressVPN app on your computer or phone, the software hides your IP address from third parties. That makes your activity more difficult for companies to trace and sell to advertisers. It helps keep your online presence more anonymous. What's more, ExpressVPN encrypts 100% of your network data to protect you from eavesdroppers and cyber criminals. That's why ExpressVPN is rated number one by CNET, Wired, Tech Radar, and countless others. So stop allowing big tech to revoke your right to free speech. Why not revoke their right to your data instead? Secure your internet with VPN I trust for online protection. Visit expressvpn.com slash Ben. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Ben to get three extra months for free with my exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash Ben. And this is one of the things that, that's been so weird about, I think, our modern politics right now uh, is the, the sort of radical skepticism that's set in of everything uh, is, is actually, it's a universal asset. Skepticism is, is useful mm -hmm. and, and necessary. But radical skepticism, meaning doubting everything around you, doubting, doubting every expert, doubting every authority, that's actually a road to nihilism. And, and I think that because it, one of the dangerous aspects of our politics and, and our institutions today is because they've failed many of them in their missions, because so many of them have, have sold out their credibility for ulterior purposes, the reaction of a lot of people has been to basically dispense with all institutions, mm -hmm. to, to, to dispense with the, the process of reasoning itself, that, that a question is deemed just as valuable as an attempt to search for an answer. Uh, that so long as I'm tearing away at the thing and showing that I am not subject to these authorities, that that means that I'm an independent thinker as opposed mm -hmm. to the reality, which is that you're going to have to accept some authorities from time to time or you're never going to get out of bed in the morning. You know, on what basis can you use your cell phone if you, if you don't believe that there are people who put it together in a way that means that it's going, that it's going to work? And I think that radical skepticism speaks to you know, the, the destruction not only of of the credibility of our institutions, but to the reactionary nature of human beings themselves. It's almost like in a time of chaos, we all seek order because we can't live in chaos. And so where are you going to find that order? You might try to find it in the institutions or you might try to find it outside of the institutions. Institutions, And it seems to me that just like there's a woke Olympics or a woke spiraling where people are becoming crazier and crazier to prove how enlightened they are, there's something like that on the right as well where the more outlandish the things that you say are, um, the more enlightened you are. And uh, I think the rest of us are just off on the sidelines, quite confused, quite 
yeah, it's like the internet with all of this conflicting information is making us uh, weary, skeptical pragmatists. And uh, I think a lot of people feel quite confused. I, I know I do about a lot of things. I, I agree. I mean, I, I think that the internet has made these things infinitely worse, mainly because it's allowed people to siphon themselves off into these bizarre silos of, of either radical skepticism or mm. radical institutionalism. And in reality, the way that I think most people used to engage with their community or with God or with religion was just naturally in their daily lives. It's why the phrase that I've been using a lot on the show and in general is everybody needs to go outside and touch some grass. Yeah, I like, like this that. is it like the, the, this this sort of attempt to either intellectualize everything or to or to anti-intellectualize everything is incredibly dangerous. I wrote an essay recently, only for myself, it wasn't published anywhere, just about why believe in God. And the answer that I came to is that no one, quote unquote, believes in God in the way that we tend to think about believing in God. Like, I don't, I don't come to my belief in God, as you say, through a bunch of arguments and read the ontological argument and go, oh, well, my, now, you know what? I'm there. Like, now, now it's happened. It's more that the assumptions that lie at the, the core of my being and at the core of my action in the world are religious assumptions. And that's true for even agnostics. Like, mm -hmm. This is a point that I've made to agnostics is you're relying on free will. You're relying on your ability to act. You're relying on the idea of an eternal truth. You're, you're using bricks from the house that I built and that you've blown up. But then you're reusing those bricks and pretending that they came from nowhere and that you actually mixed the straw with the mud. And, and you didn't. I mean, all those bricks are religious bricks. And so when we ask whether people believe in God or believe in their community— the answer is mostly in how people behave in their regular life. Mm. But the internet is not a place of behavior. The, play, the internet is a place of, of signaling. And, and signaling is very important on the internet because when, when you're, again, in a disembodied universe, then that's what happens. The way that you prove Ooh, skin in the game in a disembodied universe is by taking radical positions. The way you prove skin in the game in a real universe is by doing things oh. with other people. Wow. I'm going to have to think about that for a long time. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean... I'm glad, you know, so the Catholic Church teaches that God, the existence of God can be arrived at through philosophical argumentation independent of faith. First Vatican Council made that clear. Thomas Aquinas taught the same thing. Thomas Aquinas says, but God revealed himself to us as well, because if he didn't, he says three awkward consequences would have followed. One, some people aren't smart enough to sort through metaphysical arguments for God's existence. I probably fit in that category. Uh, second, uh, people have stuff to do. So even if they weren't smart enough, they wouldn't have the time. And then thirdly, people who have enough time and are smart enough are kind of lazy and so wouldn't have done it. And we would have come to all sorts of errors regarding God's existence. So I would say, though, when I assess arguments for God's existence alongside of arguments for atheism, I feel that the arguments for theism are much more compelling than the arguments for atheism. And the, the, when I look at arguments for atheism, I... I um, I think the argument from the hiddenness of God or the, or the problem of evil, I think are really the two most uh, emotionally disturbing arguments that, that would bother me. But when I, when I look at them next to theistic arguments, I, I, I think they get swamped personally. Yeah. And it, I'd like to go through a couple of those with you because they're really interesting. I mean, the, the argument of, of evil uh, or of suffering, mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, that, that's obviously the most, as you say, the most emotionally troubling mm -hmm. uh, when, when you see innocent suffering, and you say, where is God in all of this? And we're not talking about the easy answer for human beings, which typically, if, if a human being is, is harming another human being, and you say, okay, well, free that's will. not, right, free will, yep. that has nothing to do with God, but natural disaster, or baby dies. Uh, you know, how, how do you deal with that argument from a religious point of view? Yeah, well, I guess I would say that even if I don't have an answer to the problem of evil, I can still say, given my experience and given all these arguments I have for God's existence, which outweigh this argument, I can conclude that evil exists and I don't understand it. And that seems to me to be an okay response. Uh, back to Plantinga, he was responding to people like J.L. Mackey who would say, okay, if God's all powerful, he could do away with all evil. If he were all knowing, he would know about the nature and scope of evil in the world. If he were all good, he would want to do away with all evil, but evil exists. Therefore, God is doesn't exist, or if he does, he's either impotent, wicked, or something like that. Plantinga says that all you have to do to escape the conclusion is to insert a fourth premise, which is namely, God may have morally sufficient reasons for permitting evil and suffering in the world. You don't have to like that premise. You don't even have to think it's terribly convincing. So long as it's possible, it shows that God and evil are not uh, incompatible or, or contradictory. But at that point, you might say, okay, fair enough, but surely the amount of evil and the kinds of evil would make it at least unlikely that an all-powerful, all-good God exists. 
But I don't know, maybe I'm just not in a place epistemically to assess the evil around me. Now, if my wife was to be seriously hurt or my children seriously hurt, I might lose faith in God. Um, but the question isn't what would I do, but what should I do? So it seems to me, though, the problem of evil is felt most poign poignantly when we're experiencing a, a particular suffering in our own life. And at that point, uh, I don't think apologetics is what people want. At that point, they just want you to sort of sit with them and listen to them and mourn with them. So that's what I'd say to that. I mean, the, the, that's the answer of Job, right? I mean, the, yeah, yeah. <laughs> everybody tries to explain to Job why it's happening to him and he keeps rejecting them. And then God says, well, I'm God. You know, that's, that's the only answer that's possible, mm. which really is in the face of suffering, the only answer that, that really is possible. You're talking about the necessity of revelation from a Catholic point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you from the Jewish point of view, uh, the necessity of revelation, right? Maimonides gives many of the same reasons as Aquinas. One of the fascinating yeah. things about Maimonides and Aquinas is they're writing it effectively the same time in two different parts of the world. And they're coming to a lot of very similar conclusions about the, mm -hmm. the nature of uh, the, the sort of the, the merger of revelation and, and reason which makes sense, of course, because the, you have the, the discoveries of, of Plato again, and mm -hmm. so a lot of the Neoplaton and Platonists are, are, are coming to the fore, and so they're reading a lot of the same sort of stuff. Um, but one, the, the argument that, that I think traditionally Judaism has made about the necessity for revelation as opposed to just natural law mm -hmm. is that once you believe that human beings are capable of sussing out everything, then you do end up with the sort of possibility of human beings going astray in terms of how they themselves interpret the law. And I wonder what you make of that from a Catholic point of view, because obviously Judaism is very much focused on the law and it's focused on practice. And so when you read the first five books of the Bible, you know, it's filled with, with legalese and it's filled with specific injunctions to do and not to do. And in my religion, we follow all of those, right? I mean, we, we actually take all of the laws about kosher seriously still after, after several thousand years. And so when, when, we, when we look at that, there, there have been rabbis who have critiqued Maimonides saying, because he tries to give reasons for those commandments. He tries to say, okay, well, the reason for this commandment is X. And they say, well, we don't want you giving reasons for those commandments because the minute you do, mm -hmm. you have now run into sort of the, the problem of Plato. Is the morality above the, the commandment or is the commandment above the morality? But they say, well, the commandment's above the morality. Like your, your, your moral take on, on the commandment is, is irrelevant, which is why revelation is necessary. Mm -hmm. From a Christian point of view, where commandments are, are you know, Secondary to faith, would that be fair to say in, in Christ? Or how, how, how does that, how does the logic work there? Well, I guess I would say that Catholic, Catholics are champions, hopefully, of both faith and reason. Uh, so what has been revealed to us, we wouldn't necessarily know unless it were revealed to us. There are certain things that one can know through reason alone. We already spoke about the existence of God. Perhaps one can come to believe, Aquinas, I think, would believe this, that God is all-powerful, or all, all, all knowing, etc. But then there are things that we can't know unless they were revealed to us. So in Christianity, the, the Trinity wouldn't be something you could arrive at through reason, though there have been people who have tried to do that. They were like, okay, if God is love, then you have the one who loves, one who is love, and the love that they share, therefore, but that doesn't seem to work, I don't think. The Eucharist would be something that we couldn't know, um, uh, maybe the incarnation. So there are some things that have been revealed to us that we couldn't know otherwise, and there are some things that have been revealed to us, such as God's existence, that we could know, but it would have been dangerous because we would have come to that belief and ended up holding a bunch of uh, errors. But then once God has revealed something to us, then surely we can think about why that is reasonable, it would seem to me. No, I mean, I, I totally yeah. agree with that, but I think that the, the key element that, that Judaism puts forward and sounds like Catholicism too is, you don't do it because it's reasonable to do to, to you. You do it because God said so. Yeah. In other words, when we... And, the, and the, what God says would always be reasonable. Right. It's not like you would come into a belief. Christians would say, any belief that's been revealed to us that we can't prove, we can at least prove that it's not unreasonable. So yeah. we wouldn't believe something that's absurd. Right. So, so when it comes to the conflict supposedly between you know, miracle stories and nature, uh, the way that Aquinas says this, and I think Maimonides too, but you know Aquinas far better than I do, uh, is, is that... You're, you're either reading scripture wrong or you're reading nature wrong. Right. right? They're yeah. the same. That yeah. if, if the blueprint for the universe is in fact the biblical narrative, then if that comes into conflict with yeah. scientific discovery, then, then it's because one bad of those science things is or bad faith. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's more on this in just one moment. First, have you ever found yourself tossing and turning at night, unable to get comfortable because you're just too hot, one leg under the blanket and one leg sticking out? It's something bizarre out of a weird nightmare. Well, Bull and Branch can solve that for you. Bull and Branch is here to help you never sleep hot again with sheets that are woven to allow airflow and feel cool and crisp to the touch, perfect for sleepers who run hot. 
Bowl & Branch has amazing options for hot sleepers. You can choose from 100% organic cotton percale made with a naturally cooling weave or their linen, which is made from European flax. It be light, airy, and softer than soft. I'm telling you, the stuff from Bowl & Branch is so good. The other day, actually, I needed some for my house. Instead of calling up the advertiser, which you could do, I actually just went to their Bowl & Branch store and just shelled out myself because that's how good this stuff is. These are truly luxury sheets that get softer every time you wash them. Bowl & Branch sheets are loved by millions of sleepers. Best of all, Bowl & Branch gives you a 30-night worry-free guarantee with free shipping and returns on all U.S. orders. Get your coolest, most comfortable sleep ever during Bowl & Branch's annual summer event, 20% off site wide, plus free shipping on your first set of sheets at bullandbranch.com slash Ben. That's Bull and Branch, B-O-L-L-A-N-D, branch.com slash Ben for 20% off and free shipping. Limited time only, exclusions apply. See site for details. When it, when it comes down to, you know, practical living for mm -hmm. people, you know, why choose Catholicism versus Judaism? Because, or, or, or choose Catholicism versus Protestantism, for that matter. Because many, many of these sort of natural law things that we are all able to suss out. And Judaism does have a version of, of natural law called the, the, seven, the, the seven Commandments, the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, the, the Seven Commandments of Noah, the, the Noahide Laws. Uh, and, and the basic premise in the Talmud is that those are all discoverable by human reason mm -hmm. in the sense that there's a doctrine, Talmudically, that's called Tinok Shanishba, meaning that if you were to find a baby in a forest, you wouldn't expect the baby in the forest to know about the laws of kosher. Right? You wouldn't expect that, that, that the person grows up, they eat yeah. kosher, they're not responsible for that. There's yeah, no yeah. way that they could possibly come to the conclusion that you shouldn't eat swine, but you should eat cows, for example. But there are certain things that every human being should be able to come to the conclusion about, and that would be things like you should believe in God, you shouldn't commit murder, you shouldn't commit sexually moral sins. Mm -hmm. you know, all, all of those sorts of things are things that you can sort of discover on, on your own. So you know, when, when it comes to, to Judaism looking at natural law, there's obviously sort of boundaries to that. You, you've said the same thing is true of Catholicism. So why believe Catholicism as right. opposed to Protestantism or, or Judaism or any other form of sort of monotheistic religion? Yeah, I think the only good reason to believe anything is that you think it's true. So I think of Catholic apologetics, let's say, as a three-story mansion. On the first level, you might have theistic apologetics, which concerns does God exist and what is he like and has he revealed himself to us or not? The second level might be uh, Christian apologetics. Who was Christ? Um, uh, do we have good reason to think the New Testament reliable? Did Christ actually rise from the dead or not? Did he establish a church? These sorts of things. And then the third level would be Catholic apologetics, which would consider those Catholic distinctives. So I think that God exists, that he revealed himself most fully in the person of Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ established a church and gave that church teaching authority. And so that's why I'm a Catholic uh, and not a Protestant, and that's why I'm a Christian and not a Jew. So when you look at sort of the development of Catholic doctrine over time, this is a question in Judaism too. Mm -hmm. What are the limits of proper interpretation? And this is a huge question in Judaism because obviously you have a written document. That written mm -hmm. document is handed down, Jews believe, by God on Sinai. And then there's a whole body of oral law. And that oral law obviously has morphed over time, right? This is the sort of, Phariseistic rabbinical Judaism, that, that is traditional Judaism. And so the, the idea is that human beings have the authority to interpret, but not to remake. So if you were to go into Leviticus and just rip out a section of Leviticus and say this, this no longer applies, uh, then in Judaism, that, that's no good. Uh, by the same token, there's a constant process of interpretation and trying to figure out exactly how to apply those eternal principles to modern circumstances. Mm -hmm. How does that process work inside Catholicism? Yeah, I think the way it would work would be by saying just what you did, that nothing can contradict what has been given to us through scripture and tradition. So there are certain things that are non-negotiable, such as that baptism is efficacious in our salvation, that it's not merely a symbol, uh, that the Blessed Virgin was free from sin from the moment of her conception, that the Eucharist is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ under the appearances of bread and wine, um, that sodomy is always evil, that fornication is always evil. These sorts of things have been revealed. And so we might try to then understand things around that topic. For example, the culpability question, you know, so for example, like masturbation is something that's condemned in Catholicism and has always been. But then you might go, okay, given now what we understand about psychology, can we ask the question how culpable, uh, let's say, a young person is who is trying to figure things out, you know, or, or, uh, or alcohol, you know, like if we know that drunkenness is a sin, but, you know, you kind of have to test alcohol before you know your limits. So what about that question? Uh, so I, th I think, but that's why I would say that Christ gave us a church and gave that church authority 
uh, to help us discern these things. So I don't have to go back into 2,000 years of history, uh, but I can submit to the church uh, when it tells me things like Mary was conceived without sin and so on. Well, one of the things that's really interesting, I think, about the, the you know, anti-religion view of, of religion mm-hmm. is that you talk about sin and people get very upset. I mean, there, there is very little in mm. public life that gets people more upset than the use of the word sin. The minute you say something is a sin, people get very, very uptight. Mm. Uh, they, they believe that they are being judged, uh, and they, they think to themselves, I'm not going to listen to anything this person has to say. And what, what I think people who are not religious don't understand is that there's not a religious person alive, as far as I'm aware, who believes that, that we are capable of being sin-free. The idea mm-hmm. yeah. that, that the standard holds, even when yeah. you don't uphold the standard— uh, is something that I think is completely foreign to, to people who don't exist within religion. That's really troublesome. One of the arguments that comes up a lot in politics, and it comes up with religion too, is the hypocrisy argument. And what I've always said is that's not an argument, it's an emotional appeal. Because usually the people who are saying, okay, well, there's a priest, and this priest violated his own precepts when he did X, Y, and Z, they're not arguing that the priest did something bad. They're arguing that the standard itself is bad, and that the priest is therefore worse because the priest says that the standard is good and has violated the standard. Yeah. It's it, you know, the, the, the sort of argument that's made in, in politics and religion all the time. To me, that that, that argument is, is almost always an emotional attack on the standard itself rather than violation of the standard per se. And I go through my life violating God's precepts, I would imagine, on a fairly regular basis. And that doesn't mean that I'm right to do so. It just means that I'm a human being. Yeah, if I can kind of preach for a second here, as a Christian, I would say, and, I, and you can give me your answer as a, as a Jew, I think one of the reasons I get uptight when people point to my sinfulness is because I'm afraid. Like, I'm afraid I'm ultimately unlovable, that I am wretched at the end of the day and um, uh, unsalvageable, as it were. But the Psalms speak continually as God is our refuge. And so one thing I like to say as a Christian, because I think it's true, is that Christ is the only refuge big enough for your poor and wretched heart. And you don't need to apply your own meanness and narrow little heart to his. God is infinite in mercy. And when your sin goes up against that, this is like a drop of water being flicked into a raging furnace. So if you talk about my sin or if I become aware of it, this makes me uncomfortable. And I think at that point, what I tend to do is want to downplay my sin or look at people who are worse than me. But I think the answer is instead to look at the great mercy of God and go, okay, this is, I, my trust is in him. He is my righteousness. Yeah, so th- this has come up a lot in terms of uh, the topic of one of your books on, on pornography. Mm-hmm. So this has become like a very hot issue in the United States, obviously, and, and in Europe, particularly the, the sort of normalization of pornography. It's, it's been, I wrote about this back in 2005. I wrote a book in 2005 called Porn Generation, How Social mm-hmm. Liberalism is Corrupting Our Future, in which I talked about the destruction of an entire generation of people because of the rise of pornography, the mainstreaming of pornography. I was chided as a prude at the time, of course. Uh, and, and then, you know, pretty much all the predictions came true, that mm-hmm. this was actually really devastating to the soul of human beings, that it really harms people. And, and yet, to point out that pornography is indeed a, a grave evil, that it actually does harm to both the participants in it and the people who, who use it, uh, that, that is now considered something that is utterly unsayable in public life. Is that right? I mean, I, I think that pe- you can say it, but, but you're I, it seen as weird. It now. feels to me like the tide might be turning a mm-hmm. little bit. You know, I, I agree with you that most people would not want to say that pornography is wrong all the time. I agree with that. But it seems to me that you're hearing more, even comedians kind of making fun of things like and pornography. Pete Holmes is a good example of this. I'm not sure if you've heard this bit, but he says something like, isn't just it's double you're getting a man while being <laughs> getting you know by a man like this is this is clearly cream puffery at its highest uh to be a bit more serious saint dominic says the man who governs his passions is master of his world uh, we must command them or be enslaved by them it is better to be a hammer than an anvil and i think the man who continually uh, kind of gives over his life to pornography is becoming emasculated. He's, he's being robbed of the ability to be masculine. All right, as a Christian, I would look at Christ's words. This is my body given up for you and that this act was the most masculine act. And it's something that I should try to replicate with my own wife in that I deny myself for her good. But pornography trains a man not to say, this is my body given up for you, but the opposite. This is your body taken by me. I deny and forsake and trample over your dignity 
for the sake of, of my pleasure. So, yeah. I think this goes to one of the, the you know, most fascinating things about Catholicism in general is the, is the focus on the embodiedness of human beings, mm-hmm. uh, which, which runs directly counter to all modern strains of, of thought. Mm. So the, the, the way that the, the sort of post-Cartesian world ha- has taken up this argument is that the body is one thing and the mind is another. It's this weird Gnostic dualism yeah. that, that exists in how we think about ourselves. That, okay, so your body wants porn and your mind is separate from your body. So what damage could you be doing to yourself? uh, Because you aren't your body, you're your mind. And so your mind's out here, your body's over there, your body's doing a thing, who cares? It's just like any other act that you're doing is defecating or or eating or whatever else it is. So what difference does that make? And Catholicism insists on the embodiedness of, of human beings. You know, maybe you can talk a little bit about why that's so important and, and how that you know, the falling apart of that notion of embodiedness has really corrupted so many elements of our politics and thought. It's a great point, yeah. We are our bodies. We don't have bodies, we are bodies. We are a composite of both body and soul, both equally a part of who we are. When I kiss my daughter goodnight, I really do that. I don't manipulate the husk which is not me and press it against the husk which is not her. You know, if, if we weren't our bodies, then when we shook hands earlier, that would have been like, I don't know. We didn't ever come into contact. And that seems silly. If somebody slaps you, they slapped you. And we, we know that. Yeah. And so when we deny that we are our bodies, you're right. We can, we can either act like uh, disgracefully, sh- what I would say shamefully, or maybe we fall into the kind of... Um, thinking too highly of the body as if that's the main thing, and then we neglect the soul. But yeah, what we do with our body really matters. And so, um, I, but, but, but I do think it's important when we demonize pornography, which I like doing, that we say what the problem isn't. You know, like the problem with porn is not sex, sexual desire, or nudity. Uh, the first commandment in the Bible from God to humanity is Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And it was to have sex. Be fruitful and multiply. Sex is good, which is why you can make, make it bad. It seems to me that if the fact that you can make sex so ugly is a sort of indirect proof for why it could and should be beautiful. Because you can't make ugly things ugly. But you can make very beautiful things very ugly. Like if there was a pile of trash here and I kicked it and then said, now look at it, it it wouldn't look much uglier. It would just be ugly, you know? Um, Nudity is good. The, The body is good. The reason we talk about pornography degrading the body is because we believe that the body has grade to begin with. We don't talk about degrading paper clips and tumblers. We do talk about degrading the body because we just believe, it seems to us, that there is this sort of intrinsic worth to the body. So to sum all that up, I would say it's been said, not by me, but somebody else, the problem with pornography actually isn't that it shows too much. It's that it shows too little, that it reduces the mystery and beauty of the human person to a sort of two-dimensional thing for my consumption. And we just shouldn't be treating human beings like that. So one of the ways this is broken into the public debate, especially now, is with regard to what role religion should have in, say, government policy. Mm. So there's been a widespread debate over regulation of things like pornography. Now, for myself, I'm very much in favor of local regulation of pornography. Uh, The only reason that I might not be in favor of national legislation on pornography has nothing to do with the right to pornography. It has much more to do with the the, the pragmatic approach to to legislation. Can you govern a nation that has widespread disagreements on issues like pornography top-down in that way without spurring a backlash that would be significant Mm -hmm. enough to actually topple other things that that you're attempting to do? Uh, I think much the same way about abortion. I'm fully pro-life. Actually, I take a Catholic and not Jewish position on, on, on pro-life positions, I would say. Uh, and you know, th- with that said, there's a difference between my position on abortion and what I think might be the pragmatic way to actually achieve that long term. Yeah. So, so the argument is really not one of the morality of banning pornography or, or abortion. If I were a dictator for a day, I would absolutely do it. The question is one of the pragmatic effect. Right, and I, can I, you I achieve do. that long term? So I've had this argument about abortion or pornography with regard to, you know, for example, state-level legislation. Take abortion. So I've suggested that if you're in a state like Michigan, going for a full-scale abortion ban that is likely to fail is actually a mistake. What you should do is you should go as far as you can without losing the majority in the legislature, for example, and then accustom people to that idea and then move it back. And that's an immoral position. I get that that's not the full-scale moral position, but also you have to sort of merge pragmatism with morality. How do you address the role of of following these sorts of issues into pragmatic 
yeah, application. Yeah, we're definitely in your zone of expertise here, so I can only say what seems to me to be the case. We live in a democratic republic, so th the idea that we're going to convince most Americans that all pornography is evil and should be banned is just not going to happen. So yes, I would like to see pornography banned because I think it destroys the family. Um, you, you, know, you want to destroy society? Then destroy sex because sex is at the bottom of it. You know, it's like sex comes, comes together with a couple, which brings the, the family, which brings about the society. So if you want to destroy society, um, aim your sights on sex. And I think that's what pornography does. So I would like to see it banned. But given that I have no ability to bring that about, nor do I think it's actually going to happen, then I certainly think educating people about the destructive nature of pornography, that over the last 40 plus years, there has been a metric crap ton of studies that have come out of academia from neuroscience, psychology, and sociology. And all of it says that pornography is detrimental to the consumer, to our relationships, and to society as a whole. So it's a soundbite, but I like to say, if you're pro-love and pro-science, you should be anti-porn. Now, none of this is to condemn individuals struggling. In fact, I think we should struggle with pornography. What I mean by that is struggle doesn't mean give in to. It's not synonymous with you don't try. Struggling implies a sort of violent resisting, yeah? So if somebody says to me, I'm struggling with pornography, I would say, good, keep struggling. And so I certainly wouldn't want any man or woman out there who's watching this to feel condemned by me. I would have them realize that they were raised in a pornified culture. They were probably exposed to pornography at a young age. Um, and they can be free of this, and they should be gentle and patient with themselves as they seek to gain mastery over this thing that's had mastery over them for so long. So when it comes, again, to the corner, sort of the, the broader question of governance, and one, one, of, the, one of the cases that I've, that I've made mm -hmm. uh, is that conservatism or, or religious morality or morality of any sort, it tends to be built ground up, but it can be destroyed top down. Okay. Uh, meaning that you, institutions of American society have basically destroyed, I think, traditional morality at a very local level through things like national policy, by perverting incentive structures, by replacing, for example, the role of what a church was in a community, which actually had sort of an economic role, it had a societal role, a community role, and then government sort of supplanted that. That can be destroyed, but it, can only, it can't be rebuilt top down uh, through, through sort of government mandate. And I think that's one of the big arguments that's happening on the right right now. There are a lot of people on the right who have sort of suggested, okay, if you gain control of the government, then the first thing you should do is try to cram down morality as fast as possible, and that will change the nature of, of how the society works. Now, I'm not arguing that, that there's no situation in which that's possible. I'm just arguing as to whether that is practical. What do you think on right, that? That's more of an right. opinion matter than a moral matter. Yeah, it's a good question because um, law, it seems to me, is something of a teacher. So if I'm raised in a society where pot smoking is illegal, I might come to believe that it's immoral, whether it is or whether it isn't. But sometimes I think that uh, from my experience, again, not the ideal, but what I'm seeing is sometimes it seems like things need to be let into society so that we can learn our lesson the hard way. Because it seemed to me like five or 10 years ago, everyone was like proclaiming the greatness, which is pot smoking, for example. Whereas now it seems like there's a lot of people who are like, <laughs> The cool people are like, here's why I've given it up. Here's how my life became better. Now, how much destruction does that leave in its wake? How many people have not learned that lesson? That's a scary thing. But yeah, once the cat's out of the bag, I don't know what the solution is to do except to educate people. Again, I'm not, I'm not involved in politics or anything like that. So I'd leave that to, to better minds. I'd like to live in a, a country where pornography is illegal. I'd like to live in a country where the majority of people think, yeah, this, this destroys families. This perverts the most sacred human action. I mean, if what is the most sacred human action? It's not washing the dishes, as good as that is. I mean, it's not playing football. It's not having a drink. Clearly, it's that act by which new souls are, are come into existence. And it seems to me that a society that, that perverts that is going to destroy itself. And I think pornography is one of the... Uh, key weapons against the family. And so therefore, I'd like to see it banned. Is that pragmatic? Would that have backlashes? I, I haven't thought that through. So what do you think, going back to sort of some of our original questions, mm -hmm. what, what do you think is the best way to societally approach morality in a way to convince people? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it arguments? Is it discussion? Uh, or is it more, I think, what, what's been happening lately, which is, as you said, the excesses of the secular left have become so extraordinary and so extreme mm. that people are sort of reverting back into a second look at religion. Yeah. Uh, and, and there are a lot of people who gave it up when they were kids, mainly because 
I think for, for a lot of people, and this is true, I think, in every faith, it's, it's true in Judaism for sure, they, they get taught a sort of third grade version of what God is and what religion mm-hmm. is, and then they never kind of level up. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they are asked questions or they, they ask questions when they're 15, 16 years old. They don't have authority figures who know how to answer those questions. And then they turn away from religion because they realize that the third grade version of God is, you know, <laughs> a man in the clouds. In the sky. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. They, that doesn't actually wash with reality for them. And they turn away and then they come back and have sort of this, this second look at religion. So in, in a sort of bizarre way, it could be that the excesses of the left are, are pushing people back into religion better than any religious argument could. Seems that way. It seems, I think, sometimes that Jordan Peterson, who I recently had on my show, is like a gateway drug into religion. He seems to have supplanted the quote-unquote new atheists who are somewhat old now. Um, And so I think you're right. The excesses of the left are causing people to take a look at tradition and to perhaps be more humble in the face of our ancestors and say, what did they know that we didn't? Now, I wouldn't want to hold to Christian belief like Dawkins seems to assume, you know, just because it would hold society together. Like I would want to hold the Christian belief because I think it's true. If Christianity is not true, if God doesn't exist, then I don't think we should believe those things. You know, when I was a kid in December, I would believe in Father Christmas. And that belief made me both happier and better behaved, (laughs) especially around Christmas. But that's not a reason to go on believing in Father Christmas, Santa Claus. And it's, it's not a good reason to go on believing in God if he doesn't exist. But it's exciting to see people taking another look at it. And it's really exciting to see um, really kind of intellectually serious people, I think, like Dr. Ed Fazer, who you've had on the show, mm-hmm. Bishop Robert Barron, who you've had on the show, and others kind of help people engage with the metaphysical arguments for God's existence to show them this isn't silly. Yeah. So uh, in the, on that last point, it's a really interesting one. You know, the, the idea that you wouldn't believe in it if you didn't believe that it were true, even if you felt that it was societally good or societally useful. So one of the ways that I've seen Jordan talk about truth is in terms of pragmatic truth. Like, well, what does truth mean? Are we talking about a truth like two plus two equals four? Or are we talking about a truth like murder is wrong, uh, which are not quite the same thing? Uh, so you know, when it comes to the pragmatic truth of religion, it is easier to prove the efficacy of religion yeah. than it is to prove the factual truth of revelation on Sinai or Jesus rising from the dead. This was my experience. I was 17 years old. I was agnostic and angsty and uh, went on this trip to Rome in Italy. And the thing that began to open my mind to the possibility of Catholicism being true wasn't their arguments at first. It was their joy. They weren't cynical, they were happy, they were kind, they were normal, they were good looking. And I'd be like, why do you believe this? I'd never met people like that. I thought they were like unicorns. And then they started kind of giving me reasons. But if I hadn't have seen that joy and that optimism and that energy, maybe I would have been less open to the arguments. To get back to your original question as to how do we convince people about morality, I don't know, I think um, showing them the consequences of their actions is sometimes the the kind of camel nose Uh, under the tent, as it were. So when I would travel and speak on pornography, I wouldn't launch into a moral argument. I would say, uh, here are over 50 studies that show porn leads to sexual dysfunction. And here are 58 studies that show that porn supports the addiction model. And, you know, things like this. Like, here's how it leads to erectile dysfunction, which isn't a boon within marriage or something. So I'd kind of make fun of it. I like making fun of pornography, not the people who are struggling, but the thing, like it's clearly a, a shameful act and sort of kind of point at it and go, isn't that gross? Like, wouldn't you, you know, when I die and someone gets up and says a few things about me, I, I wouldn't be proud if they were like, he was really into <laughs> just loved it. And he was passionate about it. And that's great. Good on him. You know, you, no one wants to be remembered like that. So I, you know, when it comes to specific moral issues, maybe beginning by pointing to the negative consequences that surround the act and then bringing them into more of the heart of the matter. Uh, Like you shouldn't treat people as things who aren't things, which is not all that convincing at the beginning if you're really into porn, but at the end it might be. It's more on this in just one moment. First, it's been two years since the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Unfortunately, the number of abortions has actually increased since then due to the fact the abortion pill is now more readily available than ever. New estimates show the abortion pill accounted for over 60% of abortions in 2023. The issue of abortion should be on the mind of every American. The fact we're still debating the humanity of unborn children in 2024 is not just astounding, it's a damning indictment of our cultural decay. That is why The Daily Wire has partnered with Preborn to bring our documentary, Choosing Life, to you for free. Choosing Life serves as a powerful antidote to the left's poisonous lies about abortion. And thanks to Reborn, the series is now available to all, free of charge, over at dailywire.com. Please join me in showing your appreciation by supporting Preborn's cause. 
Preborn is the largest pro-life organization in the country. They provide free ultrasounds to moms dealing with unplanned pregnancies to introduce them to the precious life growing inside them. One ultrasound costs only $28. It could be the difference between life and death. Go to preborn.com slash Ben to donate today. That's preborn.com slash Ben or dial pound 250 and say keyword baby. That's pound 250 baby. So one, one of the sort of fascinating struggles, I think, inside religion is the, the struggle that a lot of teenagers feel between what they think are rules and freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and our society has elevated freedom above rules. And in fact, rules are now seen as impositions on the self. Uh, mm-hmm. it, what your parents want of you is an imposition on you. What your institutions demand of you is an imposition on you. You're supposed to be a freewheeling individual who's free of all of these things. And freedom is the central the sort of central goal, yeah. Uh, you know, and and I think that you know one of the one of the things that I've been arguing for for a long time is that you know freedom. And, and it's a place where I have some disagreements actually with some people who I'm very close friends with, the Daily Wire, and I've you know, found some commonality with with the aforementioned Michael Mills, who's execrable in every other fashion, but he agrees <laughs> with me on this. Uh, and, and and that is that the that that freedom is of instrumental rather than inherent value. This is a John Finnis argument okay. that, that effectively speaking. Now, the idea that freedom is the highest value, yeah, or that right. liberty, yeah. sort of in, liberty, ennobles any enterprise, yeah. as as opposed to virtue, which does ennoble any enterprise, right? That 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 is not true. It, that there's an argument Joseph Raz makes, the philosopher, that that effectively, if if you are told that there's a gun to your head and you have to kill the guy next to you, and you do that. Are you more or less morally blameworthy than if you say, listen, right. I chose to kill the guy next to me, right? right liberty has right. not ennobled the project in any yes, sort of way. Yes, liberty yes. has actually made it significantly worse because now you bear moral culpability for it. So in other words, the exercise of liberty was originally meant to exist within boundaries. And that, that that's the whole sort of role of religion. It's, it's meant for choice when there is, is moral, apathy is the wrong word, but there, there, there's no moral demand that is placed upon you to act in a particular way. And society by championing liberty and rights above the, the roles that they were meant to exist within mm-hmm. has, has destroyed a lot that, that surrounds it. And I think that, that that's what you're seeing a lot in Western society is that the idea of the individual, the freewheeling individual standing up against institutions, that, that has led to the destruction of many of these institutions. Right. I agree. Freedom exists for the sake of love. And we can be free from things, but we are also free for things. As uh, the late Archbishop Fulton Sheen joked, you don't go up to a cab driver and say, are you free? And when he says yes, you say, hooray for freedom. Freedom exists for something. And so it seems to me that in America and other countries, when you talk about freedom today, we often mean freedom from constraints. But we should be free for things as well. You know, like the man who can't say no to his next beer, is he free? No, he's kind of enslaved by his passions. The man who cannot say no to look at pornography, is he free? And so on and so forth. And th- this is a case that I've made that it's, it's a huge mistake people make in quoting Exodus. When they say, when Moses says, let my people go, there's, a, there's an end to that verse, right? So that they may serve me in the wilderness. And everybody always forgets the second <laughs> half of the verse, right? You yes. need the second half of the verse in order to make sense of the first. Yeah. The basic idea of just innate human freedom as the highest value is not a biblical concept. It, mm-hmm. it really is not because you're supposed to be subject to the mission that God has, has placed in front of you. One of the theories that I've been developing over time is, is something that, I'm sure it's not original to me, but, but I've, I've termed for purposes of discussion role theory. And that is that what religion really is, what the Bible really is attempting to do on sort of a practical level, is it sets up and enshrines roles for human beings. And there are a wide variety of, of these roles as opposed to sort of virtue ethics, which is about cultivating virtue within yourself and it's sort of hard to define mm-hmm. uh, because virtue can be interpreted in so many different ways okay. or or deontological ethics, uh, the idea of a rule-based ethical morality, which, again, Judaism sometimes falls into, uh, this idea that there are rules for everything. But the the suggestion that, that I make is that what those rules are really designed to do in Judaism or the way that religion is generally designed is in order to preserve certain important roles that you're meant to fulfill. The, the roles that basically are spelled out to Adam. You're supposed to cultivate the garden. You're supposed to be a husband. You're supposed to be a father. You're supposed to be somebody who is a creative force, able to name the animals. Right? These are all roles. And then yeah. liberty exists within those roles. But as soon as liberty begins to destroy those roles, mm-hmm. then liberty has become libertinism and is, and is effectively destructive. Yeah, whoever sins is a slave to sin. And uh, the Lord is calling me to love my wife and to love my children and to put, put them above other things, above other pursuits. And all my other pursuits should be ordered towards those ends. Uh, but if I begin to engage in pornography or adultery or binge drinking, then my freedom to do that very thing that God is calling me to is now impeded and everyone suffers as a result and I become less happy. So uh, on a broader level, what do you think are the biggest dangers to religion today? Because it seems like well, there, there's sort of bizarre optimism that has emerged between the two of us about the, the failures of secularism leading to a 
reversion back to more traditional religion. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the numbers are showing in, say, Europe or the United States. What they're showing is decline in church attendance yeah. in Europe and the United States, which is devastating, I think, on a, on a general level. I mean, I've been calling for people to go back to church as a Jew. If you're a Christian, go to church. You should. It's better for you. It's better for your kids. We need more Christians in American society, and we mm. need more. We, we need them in, in European society. Yeah, they, what do you think is the is the greatest danger to to religion today? I can only well, I can't only, but I will only speak about Catholicism. It feels like to me sometimes that the church is being or the ha the, the house is being burnt down from two sides. <laughs> On one side, I would say it's the fire of modernism, and this might be the most dangerous thing, namely trying to make the church like the world, where we just kind of run after the world and bend down before the world and but on the other side it's a sort of um, a sort of set of accountism where we where we kind of uh, reject the authority of the Pope of Rome uh, and sort of set up ourselves as the arbitrator as to what is true and what isn't and who we should listen to and who we shouldn't and those are two very kind of polar opposite things I think you're, they're reactions to both, maybe. And so uh, we see the abuses within the church. We see certain sins not being condemned as forcefully and loudly as they should be. Uh, we see perhaps liturgies that are celebrated with uh, a lack of care and reverence. And so because that seems like a, such a threat, we, we rush to the other side and where you know, we do have good priests you know, preaching against the evils of abortion and things like this, but then maybe there are other errors involved here that we haven't begun to look at. Does, does, do you have something like that in, in your community? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, so I think that typically speaking, since the Enlightenment, the big danger to Judaism has been the rise of modernism, the rise of individualism. The, the one thing that Jews held in common during the 1700 years or so when Jews were effectively forced into ghettos mm -hmm. uh, is that they were in the ghetto. So they, this is the idea was that they were forced together. They were, they were for, Judaism was defined by keeping the law and then the gates were opened and then it was like, okay, well you can now become a citizen of general society. And that forced a sort of crisis in Judaism that was, that was approached from three different angles. One was a full sort of assimilationist ideology. Yeah. My Jewishness should disappear. That would be good. Uh, and I should just become a citizen like any other. And then there was a sort of a sort of halfway position, which was the, the best of the modern world can be taken in by Judaism and engulfed in Judaism. And Judaism can essentially filter out through the modern world, taking the best parts of it and rejecting the worst yeah. parts. And then there is a, a full-scale rejectionism by parts of the Jewish community. And that was, okay, well, when you open the gates, you also let in a bunch of bad influences. And so you see that breakdown in, I would say, the modern world uh, in terms of sort of reform Judaism in the United States or reconstructionist Judaism. Uh, that would be sort of the first more accommodationist assimilationist view, uh, the, the sort of modern orthodox, which I consider myself, which is the, the sort of merger of uh, not secular values, but, but secular technologies uh, with, with, with Jewish values uh, and living in the modern world, having a job, you know, accommodating yourself to, to, to democracy, the, these sorts of things. And then you have you know, wings of the Jewish community that would probably be termed ultra-orthodox by the media, where the goal is to just shut off all influences whatsoever because you're so afraid that those yeah, influences yeah. are going to draw your kid out into the open where they're, where they're going to be attacked. And y you can see you know, the truth in, in particularly the, the sort of rejectionist viewpoint that the danger is so great that you just can't allow yourself any sort of interface with reality. The problem is, of course, that that removes the biblical commandment to be a light unto the nations. Because yeah. once you've stopped engaging with the world, in my viewpoint, from a Jewish viewpoint, yeah. uh, then you've, what, what, what is the mission at that point other than to sort of just hold steady? And, and I think that, that that has tended to happen in, you know, I, don't, I feel like that, that, that's mirrored in some aspects of Catholicism also. That, that a vibrant and functioning religious community has to have both an internal vision as to how you preserve your, your community yeah. and an external vision as to how you wish to transform the world mm -hmm. and spread the light that you're supposed to bring to the world. And the more missional your religion is, the more it's likely to give your kids a sense of mission and lead to a sense of growth as opposed to decline. And I think that you can kind of tell it by its fruit. So, you know, one of the things about the state of Israel right now is that the state of Israel is the only Western society that has above replacement rates of birth. Mm. Uh, it is, which is kind of an astonishing thing. You go to Tel Aviv, which is a secular center of Israel. And because there's sort of a national mission in Israel, people in Tel Aviv average over three, the fertility rate's over three mm -hmm. per woman. This is like a place that is secular as, as San Francisco, but they're culturally oriented toward the Jewish state, to take an example. 
without a common mission within Catholicism mm -hmm. and, and a muscular mission within Catholicism, I think yeah. that it tends to wither on the vine as well. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I think there is a reaction to a sort of pansy Catholicism or a reaction to Catholics who apologize for the hard stances the church has taken against so-called marriage, which is a fiction, or contraception or uh, what have you. We've seen a lot of leadership and then ourselves, we always like to point to leadership, we fail to point at ourselves, uh, have maybe um, be, been too soft, too weak in proclaiming what Catholicism should be proclaiming. And so you see a reaction to that and part of that reaction is fantastic and then some of it might lack charity. I think there's also like a contingent within Catholicism that wants to go back to what they see as the glory days during the Crusades or something. But the way I see it, it feels like, um, I don't know, Christendom is kind of back to the first couple of centuries. And so our, our, our goal shouldn't be to go back to the, the 13th century, but to go back to how the early uh, Christians lived in communities with each other, loving one another. You know, the, the Romans said, uh, who are these people? They, they knew them by how they loved each other. And so, it was Stephen Covey in, his, uh, in one of his books that talked about this, the sphere of influence, uh, sphere of control, sphere of power, you know? And I, I don't know, I think more and more, I, I wanna be concerned about the things I have authority over. And I wanna be less concerned about the things I can do nothing about. Because when I spend my days listening to the terrifying news that's taking place, either in the country or sometimes within the church, I'm not actually dedicating my time and energy to the thing that God has given me authority over, namely my wife and my children and my, and my apostolate, my mission. But what I find is when I actually dedicate my time there and sort of block out the noise that shouldn't concern me because I can do nothing about it anyway, uh, I find that my sphere of influence actually begins to grow. So I think a cause for uh, a cause of anxiety among many people today is just this onslaught of bad things that are taking place. And it's kind of addictive. Like it's really, I, I, I wonder how you do this every day when you wake up and stick your head in the toilet bowl and go, what's in here? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, how, how do you? That is news coverage. Yeah. How, I mean, yeah, how do you stay sane? I mean, uh, you know, for, for me, the key is limiting the exposure, mm -hmm. right? So, so I don't have Twitter on my phone, for example. And that's a deliberate decision yeah. not to have Twitter on my phone. So I engage with it particular hours of the day and then I just don't engage with it a lot of other times of the day. And when I'm not engaged with it, I'm engaged with my family full time. I'm engaged with my community full time. And is the Sabbath just awesome? The, the Sabbath is the greatest thing that God ever invented. It is the best thing. <sighs> and you know, the, the death of the Sabbath is the worst thing that I think has happened to Western civilization. Christians like, need to adopt this. This in, I, I would like to see something like, maybe not exactly like this, but I think old people would benefit mentally just from totally detaching and unplugging. 100%. What do you do with your lights on like Friday evening? So we have a presets. So you can get electronic presets these days. It makes it very convenient. So you can you can set the, the lights that they go off at a certain hour and on at a certain hour. Mm -hmm. uh, or you just leave them on before Sabbath and you figure out, okay, like I, I don't want the light on in my bedroom, but I do want it on in the kitchen. Is your and, fridge still running? Uh, so they have a Sabbath mode on the fridge. Come so on. Can, so it actually keeps the fridge running, but the light is off inside. Sabbath the, mode. That's yeah, exactly. amazing. <laughs> so depending on, on the kind of fridge you have, virtually all of them now have a Sabbath mode where it can oh. turn off the light. So modern technology has made Sabbath like super easy in certain ways because you can actually preset all this stuff. There was a big controversy in in, in Jewish circles over how to treat electricity mm. uh, in the in the early days when electricity became very you know common. And so there was some talk about like, is this capable of use on Sabbath or not. So the way that the Jews try to uh, em embody sort of broader ideas about the Sabbath is obviously with law. So for example, the way that we define the Sabbath is we say there are 39 different malachot, right, actions uh, that are rules about how you can act on the Sabbath. We define those by things that were done in the tabernacle during the normal week, but you couldn't do them on the Sabbath, right? So you weren't allowed to do them. So we learned from that from the Bible, right, that you weren't allowed to, for example, build. You weren't allowed to kindle a fire on Sabbath. So then you extend those principles out into a variety of sort of, you know, other laws. So the question was, how do you treat electricity? Is electricity uh, a, a thing that is banned by these rules or not? And it was a big controversy at the time, the early 20th century particularly. And, you know, the, the kind of solution that Judaism came up with, because it tends to be a religion that, that treasures the old as opposed to the new, was we are going to, well, we'll come up with some kind of what I think are, are jerry-rigged excuses for why electricity is not to be used on the Sabbath. Okay. Uh, so they, they suggest that it's akin to fire, for example, uh, or that when you complete a circuit, that's a form of building. What's funny about this, I think, is that I was thinking about this a lot in the context of just generalized religious doctrine, 
So one of the big criticisms, obviously inside religion, is too doctrinal, right? You get this in Catholicism too. So much doctrine. So why, why do you have so much doctrine? Why can't we just cut through the thicket? And, and the answer is because in the absence of doctrine, you end up actually destroying the principle. Mm. And so I, I was thinking about this in the context of euthanasia, for example. So Catholicism has, you tell me yeah, if I'm wrong. you shouldn't kill innocent people. Right, you shouldn't kill innocent people. But there is also the doctrine of double effect, meaning right. if you have like an older person, you, you, there, you don't have to take abnormal right, right. You know, measures in order to save that person's life. Yes, yes. And also, if you're attempting to alleviate pain yeah. right, by giving morphine and the person dies because yeah. and you might even foresee that but you didn't intend it exactly so if you are a secular person you're like well, what difference does that make what you foresaw or what you didn't foresee yeah. you're just killing the person with morphine like what difference does that yeah. make but it's the doctrine that protects against the abuse yeah meaning that because catholicism says no you're attempting to alleviate pain you're not attempting to kill that prevents you from just saying okay kill the old guy right right and, and so i think that, that judaism you you look at things like i was just talking about with regards to turning lights on and off on sabbath it's like oh my god that's so legalistic why don't you just ask the guy to turn it on or turn it on yourself like what's the problem but the whole point is that once you once you say it is okay to turn on the light then it becomes okay to turn on the light yeah and once it's okay to turn on the light it's okay to turn on your phone once right. it's okay to turn on your phone then it's okay to do a wide variety of activities that you don't actually want people doing on sabbath and so there's the, there, there are a bunch of catch-all terms in in judaism like they'll say something is not shabbistic Okay, Shabbos stick just means in Yiddish that it's not something that you should do on Shabbos. It's not recommended. Uh -huh. There's a lot of not recommended. What would be an Judaism. example of something, uh, of something that you shouldn't Shabbos do? But okay, so for example, I could theoretically leave on my TV all of Shabbos. Hey. Right, I turn on just like a light. I could leave it on on Friday night before uh -huh. Shabbos comes in. I could leave it on. I could watch the ball game on, right. on Saturday. That would be considered not Shabbos stick, right? Like it's not in keeping with the spirit yeah. Uh, of, of Shabbos. How do you cook? This has now become me interviewing you. But yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep going. It's interesting. You, I, I, don't, I never get these questions. So how do you cook food? Okay, so the answer is that you're not allowed to cook okay. on Saturday. You're allowed to reheat things. But if, for example, so I'm not allowed to cook. A, it comes down to liquid versus solid. It gets very abstruse. So, for example, uh, I'm allowed to leave something cooking from before Shabbat. This is why you see people eat cholent, right? Cholent is like a stew. Okay. Uh, so it's a very common in the Jewish community, eat cholent. Uh, and so you'll leave it on cooking like all night. And because you didn't start the cooking process gotcha. on Shabbat, you just left it there. Okay. But if you take the cholent off, you're not allowed to put it back on the flame, right? Because okay. then now you've now you've started a new yeah. cooking process. Cholent's actually started to become a thing because of the fight between Karaites and Pharisees. Uh, and, and okay. Because Karaites said, well, it says you shouldn't kindle a flame. And so if you're kindling a flame, that means you really shouldn't use the flame. Yeah. And so the, the Pharisees were like, well, no, it says that you're not supposed to kindle a new flame. And so it became a cultural differentiator yeah. to actually start cooking something before Shabbat and leave it cooking over Shabbat yeah. to say, I'm a Pharisee, ah. I'm not a Karaite, for example. So like they, Fascinating. Yeah, it's, 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 it's really interesting. So the, you're allowed to reheat solid food. So if I have like a, if, if I have, you know. Chicken a, or something? A, yeah, like chicken, as long as there's not too much sauce, okay. right? Because the sauce turns it into a soup. Okay. Uh, so it, like it gets, it gets yeah, very, yeah. very detailed. No, but you're right. It's like with children, you know, we all understand, give them an inch, they'll take a mile. Well, we're like that as well. And so when you start to shut down these rules, the whole thing. And this is one of the things that I think is so fascinating about Catholicism. I've talked about this with Bishop Barron, uh -huh. is that Catholicism, Christianity started off as a rip on Phariseeism, obviously, from a philosophical <laughs> yeah. level, right? Our top off, guy was doing that, yeah. Right. And, 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 again, Lord. And, and again, that's not that's actually nothing new in sort of Jewish history in the sense that Jeremiah does the same thing, right? right. If you read the prophets, the prophets are constantly saying things like, Does God need your sacrifices? He needs you to be kind to the poor, he needs you to give charity, he needs you to he needs you to think about virtue. Does he really need like roast meat? Right, that, that's that's actually Jesus is saying something. That's that's why Jesus is Jewish. I mean, he's not saying anything that's actually super foreign to Judaism okay. in the segments where he's criticizing Phariseeism. Yep, yep, yep. uh, but the the attempt of Christianity to sort of get rid of aspects of the law, this is a question I have for for Christians, ends up being backfilled by attempts to sort of reinstate the law. Meaning Catholicism is rich in doctrine. So if Christianity started off as an attempt to get rid of, of many of the rules as, as unnecessary in order to reach the virtue that, that the rules were attempting to, to mm -hmm. reach, then you know, how, why is it that there is so much doctrine in Catholicism? What like, would be, Catholicism in terms what would be of coming back. Yeah, can you think of an example within Catholicism? You're like, that's really interesting that you do that. Like, so all the ritual, for example. Yeah, like yeah. At, at mass or divine liturgy, those sorts of things. Right, exactly. Or, like that, that sounds very Judaic, meaning like yeah. Judaism mandates priests, you're supposed to have. daven three times a day. There's like an actual set service, right? Oh. And so three times a day, davening is praying, sorry. Uh, they, <laughs> I slip into the, yeah. the Judaic language. Um, but you, know, you pray three times a day, and you say the same service three times a day, and it's very ritualistic, and it's yep. very... Repetitive. And I have very ritualistic prayers that I pray. Every single morning, I have a very specific thing that I do. Every night, I have a very specific prayer that I pray. 
And these sort of anchor me throughout the day. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that what, what's what's fascinating is how the divergence, the original divergence, yeah. ends up becoming more of a convergence. If you if you watch how Catholics practice and how Orthodox Jews practice, there is similarity. There's there. a lot of similarity there. Yeah, I don't know if it was that we kept the you know we kept the the moral law, not the Mosaic law, because the understanding was now that the Mosaic law wasn't what justified you or saved you or something like that. Um, I have another question for you. Why don't you want me to be a Jew, or do you? Uh, I don't care. Yeah, so that, why? That, why? Because because I want you to be Catholic, obviously. Right. No. Yeah. And, and by the way, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Like this is what I've always said to to my Catholic friends, my Protestant friends. Yeah. They, as long as you're coming at me with a book and not a sword, that's, right. that's great. And I mean, they're not I'm being fine. annoying and yeah, you know, exactly. just like, uh, berating you or something like that. I, but. I mean, even if even if you want to be annoying about it, that's fine. With, like you care <laughs> enough about my soul that you want me to be saved. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. It's much appreciated, and we'll find out at, in the overtime period uh-huh. who is right and who is wrong. But the but, but why yeah why don't you because you, we, we talked about it earlier about the only reason you should believe something is because it's true right you presumably believe I believe falsehoods and you believe true things so why shouldn't you encourage me to abandon some of my beliefs and adopt some of yours right so doctrinally what Judaism believes is that the commandments of Israel were only given to Israel okay meaning that the the seven Noahide commandments that I referred to earlier those are incumbent on all of humanity because they're given to Noah right before the Jews actually arise as an independent family and people mm-hmm. and so those apply to everyone so if you're not a member of the Judaic tribe then those rules don't apply to you so the 613 commandments that apply to me are boiled down to seven for you mm-hmm. and so what that means is that if you want to join in to do those commandments like that's not required of you like sure you Welcome if you want, but it's a, but certainly Judaism doesn't feel the necessity to force like, to evangelize and to bring people because into Judaism there. doesn't actually suggest being chosen doesn't mean being superior, right? I think this is one of the great you know, misnomers of, of sort of history mm-hmm. is that when the Jews say that that they're a chosen people, what they mean is that they're better than everyone else. And it's like no, in the same way that if I choose my oldest child to yeah. take out the trash, yeah. that doesn't mean that my oldest child is better. It means I, I need my oldest child to take out the trash. Like that's not the same thing. Okay. Uh, and so the, the the sort of idea that Jews are in their own minds superior to everybody else because they it is it is incumbent on them to do that. That that's obviously not how Jews think, especially because there are a bunch of commandments that are incumbent on men in Judaism that are not incumbent on women in Judaism. Does Judaism then believe oh, that see. women are of lesser value I see. than than? Than men, I mean. But, so, but apart from the little laws, there must be like metaphysical things that you hold as true that you would like me to believe. Um, so, or at least you would like me. I don't mean to be confrontational, yeah, but no, you, no, would, you would clearly would you would want Christians to realize that Christ was not the Messiah. That he didn't. Write. Maybe you don't want that, or maybe it doesn't bother you. You don't care one way or the other. Right. So the so the the, the way. But like that, like when I look at when I look at Mormons, you know, I'm like, right. look, I love you, and this isn't a criticism on you directly, but Joseph Smith was not a prophet. My Muslim friend, I love you, but like Muhammad was a liar or a lunatic. Maybe he was possessed, but he wasn't a he right. wasn't a prophet. Right. So the, I, the, I have to say that in love, and so I would wonder. And maybe it's just that you have a public platform, and so you don't want to get into that to offend no, people really, necessarily. Really but in it really person, isn't that. I mean, okay. the Jewish doctrine is that as long as you believe in God, as long as I mean, the, the actual seven, the actual seven commandments to to non Jews are believe in God. Uh, no eating the flesh of living animals, actually one of them. Uh, you have to establish courts of law, no murder, no sexual sins, no idolatry, um, and uh, I believe no stealing. They, 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 it's like seven seven of the ten, in, okay. uh, of the big ten, right? Yeah, yeah. Like We don't actually believe that, that non-Jews are even bound by the Ten Commandments. right? They're bound by the seven commandments in Judaism. Hey. So, it's, so it like boils even further down. So how you believe in God is of little consequence to me so long as you do believe in the monotheistic God. What if I believe in a God that lives on top of a mountain and whose name is Jeffrey? So if he doesn't <laughs> and fulfill, I say, that's if, God. If he doesn't I believe- fulfill the fundamental properties of God, then that doesn't count. Which would be what? Uh, so the fundamental properties of God would be that he's in charge of the universe, creator of the universe, yeah. master of the divine law, uh, yeah. all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving would, would probably be okay. in that category. Um, yeah, there, there's debate in, in sort of Jewish circles as to whether you have to believe that God gave the commandments at Sinai, whether that, that, that's a debate between a couple of major rabbis, Maimonides included, as to whether if you discover those seven laws on your own, but you don't believe that they were given at Sinai, does that count? Mm. Right? The, the, so there is some doctrinal debate there. But in general, the basic idea that there is only one path to God in the same way that there is in Christianity. I see. Uh, that, that doesn't exist in the same way. What about like a Mormon who believed that God was once a man like we are? Like, would you would you go, okay, I, I'm not no, no, saying so you've is, given no, much I, thought I, about I, this, but th- would that be a place so, where you'd be like, no, I need to evangelize you, or not that word, but I, I need you to come to believe in uh, God so differently the, than you currently do. So the answer to me is, I'm going to go with the I don't know answer. <laughs> I, like, is, like, like pretty much everything we else both get Judaism, free. there's like major debate on, on all of these things. There's a debate for a long time in Judaism 
over whether, say, Trinitarianism uh, is monotheism or if it's not monotheism. Right, like that's yeah. like that. That was a serious debate in in Judaism. It's come down on the side of it's monotheism. Okay, uh, so it's so I, I wouldn't know the answer as yeah, far yeah. as you know Mormon doctrine specifically. Let's put it this way: if if you're talking about like pagan paganism, Judaism would have a problem with paganism. Mm. So let's say that you believed that there were a hundred gods and they all ruled over different aspects yeah. of humanity. Then Judaism would say that does not fulfill the seven. And if you seven. were in dialogue with somebody like this, would you feel obligated to try to help them? To help divest them of that error so that they could be saved? Sure. I mean, the, yeah. The, yeah. Cool. The, the, so the, so then, then I would feel obligated to actually, yeah. in the same way that if somebody believed that adultery was right. morally acceptable, I would feel the obligation to say, well, no, you actually, adultery is not morally acceptable, mm-hmm. and, and it's better for you to not believe that. Okay. So that, so Ju- Judaism is, is very weird that way. And, and historically speaking, it's kind of interesting to see whether that is an outgrowth of the direction of Jewish history or that was inherent to the religion, mm. right? Because obviously when Joshua comes into the land, mm-hmm. mass conversion yeah. takes place, right? Yes. Uh, when uh, when in the pre-Christian era, the Judaism was one of the fastest growing religions in the Roman Empire. A huge percentage of Alexandria was Jewish. Uh, there, there, was, there were huge Jewish communities in Egypt. And so it was, a, it was an actual more proselytizing religion. And so one of the questions of Jewish history is sort of- How did that it, it, it did, what was yeah. Was the Jewish- move away from proselytization, historically driven or ideologically driven, or is it a sort of ideological justification of how history had gone? Mm. Uh, in, in the same way that, for example, if you look at the historicity of matrilineal lineage in Judaism, right, if you read the Bible, it seems pretty clear that lineage is through the father, mm-hmm. right? But in Judaism, lineage mm. is through the mom, yeah, right? So the question is when that sort of shifted. And historically speaking, that's probably around the time of Ezra. It's like four, uh, 400 BC or so, something okay. like that. Um, but, you know, there, there are all these sort of weird issues in, in sort of biblical adherence as to when things shift and, and how the history of that goes. Well, thank you. One day I'm going to have to have you on my show and just yeah, ask exactly. you questions for a couple of hours. Uh, again, you should. Yeah, I, I know what I know. There are rabbis who know way more than I do, uh, who I would, I would definitely recommend that you talk to. And so you can get sort of the basics from me, and then yeah, I'll yeah. tell you that I don't know a lot of things on that show. Yeah. But, yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, the one thing that, that comes through just kind of sum up in, in terms of where we are religiously, and this is the, this is the case that I, I've been consistently making, is that when we talk about the, you know, the West and Western civilization, that a muscular pursuit of religious values, and in the West you're talking Christian values, is absolutely necessary to the upholding of the West, that all the fundamental premises of the West are built on these Christian values. The reason people say Judeo-Christian is just because many of those values are held in common with Judaism, and obviously Christianity and the New Testament are based on the Old Testament originally. Um, but the eternal values of, of Judeo-Christianity, of biblical living, uh, the, those haven't changed with time, and they can't change with time, and they shouldn't change with time. What do you think is the best way to insulate mm. those, those values from the predations that we've been talking about? Against, say, the family? Or? Yes, I mean, the attacks on the family would be an excellent. <sighs> yeah, I... Um... I think withhold, I, I think I, I'm being hyperbolic, okay? So if people stretch this too far, they'll misunderstand me, but get married before you're ready, have more kids than you can afford, and then move into a bubble of other like-minded people and raise them in the faith. Um, now, of course, I could qualify all of those things. Obviously, you should discern. You know, Obviously, you shouldn't have more children than you can afford or if you're, you know, it's, it's dangerous to the wife or something like that. And, and by bubble, I don't mean solipsistic living where it's insular and we don't engage with the outside world. But there's a sense in which all of those things are right. You know, people talk about communities today as bubbles disparagingly, but that's how humans have lived forever. This new way of living where we live on a street next to people we don't know, this is unusual. Uh, so I live in a little town in Ohio. It's not a very pretty town, but there's a lot of fantastic people who live there. And uh, we kind of have the same values. And so my 15-year-old daughter doesn't have a cell phone, and it's never really occurred to her to ask for one because we hang out with other homeschooling families who also, of course, wouldn't give their child a smartphone. Living life in kind of a common like that where my children don't have to feel like freaks because they don't have Instagram is really helpful. You know, like if I was to send my child to a school, be it Catholic or public, and he didn't have a phone or she didn't have a phone, they would be a sort of, um, they'd feel like a social leper by the time they were nine or 10. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of homeschooling. I don't think it's the only way, but it's the, the way we've chosen. 
But then I also think you, you clearly want to have your children engage with the world. And so we speak really openly with our children from, from very young about, like I teach my kids about pornography from, about, from the age of six. I say something simple like pornography is pictures or videos of people showing parts of their body that their bathing suit should cover and you should always tell me if you see it. Very unscandalous, you know. So educating them in that way and uh, I don't know. And then, and then just having other attractive, by attractive I mean just good normal people in their life. So it's not just my head saying these things, it's the next door neighbor, it's the friends, it's, does that make sense? Not only does that make sense, I, I, I live very much the same way. Right? Yeah. I think that the, la- the, the loss of community is the single greatest factor in the decline of religion. Yeah. The, the, sub- the supplantation of, of community by government in terms of even things like financial support, like one of the things that church used to provide, and it still does where, yeah. where I live. Yeah, yeah. If there's somebody out of a job in my community, we all try to find that person a job. And if that person falls, I love on how a hard Jews time, do that. I wish, I wish Catholics were more tribal like that. Yeah, I mean, that's it's, awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's but I think that's true for for church. I mean, Mormons do it too. I mean, like I don't I don't think it's unique to Judaism. In other words, yeah. But, it, but yes, we definitely. And Mormons do that. are great like that too. Yeah, I mean, like I, I think that you know, if, if somebody in our neighborhood is having a hard time, people immediately step up and you know, we'll mm-hmm. move to pay their bills and, and try to try to help them out. Yeah. And and that sort of economic interdependence actually creates a thriving society. And that's how things used to be. I mean, it also means that rich people hang out with poor people, right? Class divisions go away when you're all attending the same synagogue or the same church and you're all pointed in the, you're praying in the same direction. You're not praying to the richest guy. You're praying yeah. toward the front of the church. Yep. Those bonds cannot be duplicated. They're, they're, you can't remake them in their sad social fashion. Like it's, it's, it's bizarre. You had the, the Surgeon General of the United States say that loneliness is a public health issue. And I just thought to myself, yeah, but the government can't solve that public health issue. The only way to solve that public health issue is you need to go to synagogue or church. Like, that's the only way to solve that issue because there's nothing quite like, you know, being engrossed in a community. And that does set social standards. I mentioned the birth rate in Israel. One of the reasons you have that birth rate is because everyone around you has four kids. That's great. Right? I mean, like, in our community, like, four is a bare minimum. Yep. Like, when we had our fourth kid, it was like, okay, welcome to the club now. <laughs> like, where are, the, where are the other four? You know, like, that sort of generalized social expectation and a recognition that that requires community support. Meaning, mm-hmm. if you're at the playground and a kid is acting badly, in American society, if, if someone says something to your kid at the playground, then you are supposed to get mad at that. How dare you parent my child? That's terrible that you're parenting my child. Well, in a traditional religious community, if somebody yeah. parents my child, the answer is good. They should be parented. Like if I'm not watching and my kid does something right. bad, yeah. I want somebody to discipline my kid uh-huh. because we all hold the same standard. And that's why we have to hold the same standard when we live in these in these sorts of communities. It would probably be unchristian to suggest that we come up with a bumper sticker that just says, outbreed the bastards. Would that be <laughs> wrong? I don't know. But uh, why? so that's cool. So Judaism, you guys have a lot of kids. Mormons have a lot of kids. Well, was, the, the, the outbreak, outbreak is, is Catholics the, try. Yeah, I mean that's going to be try that out. is going to be the Crush the future it. of humanity is going to be the unfortunately because the, we just the, need to breed, but then not have them indoctrinated into atheism and, and modernism. So I, I was at the store the other day. My wife came out and she went. There was a family in there and they had a lot of kids. And I went, were they neat or disheveled? Neat. Ah, Mormons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If they look terrible and stained, those were good Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> well, Matt, it's been amazing to have you here. I yeah. really appreciate it. You should, everybody should go check out your work because it really is fantastic. Again, thank you for the time. Thanks. The Ben Shapiro Sunday Special is produced by Savannah Morris and Matt Kemp. Associate producers are Jake Pollock and John Crick. Editing is by Olivia Stewart. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Camera and lighting is by Zach Ginta. Hair, makeup, and wardrobe by Fabiola Cristina. Title graphics are by Cynthia Angulo. Executive assistant, Kelly Carvalho. Executive in charge of production is David Wormus. Executive producer, Justin Siegel. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. The Ben Shapiro Show Sunday special is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2024.